Chapter 2. Part 2. She hesitated, then, before her resolution could falter, she closed the door behind her. A slight shudder shook her as she glanced up and down the street, which lay silent and bare. This daughter of aristocrats had never before ventured unattended outside her ancestral palace. Then, stealing herself, she went swiftly up the street. Her satin-slippered feet fell lightly on the pave, but their soft sound brought her heart into her throat. She imagined their fall echoing thunderously through the cavernous city, rousing ragged rat-eyed figures in hidden lairs among the sewers. Every shadow seemed to hide a lurking assassin, every blank doorway to mask the slinking hounds of darkness. Then she started violently. Ahead of her a figure appeared on the eerie street. She drew quickly into a clump of shadows, which now seemed like a haven of refuge, her pulse pounding. The approaching figure went not furtively, like a thief, or timidly, like a fearful traveler. He strode down the night street as one who has no need or desire to walk softly. An unconscious swagger was in his stride, and his footfalls resounded on the pave. As he passed near a cresset she saw him plainly, a tall man, in the chainmail hauberk of a mercenary. She braced herself, then darted from the shadow, holding her cloak close about her. Saw him. His sword flashed half out of his sheath. It halted when he saw it was only a woman that stood before him, but his quick glance went over her head, seeking the shadows for possible confederates. He stood facing her, his hand on the long hilt that jutted forward from beneath the scarlet cloak which flowed carelessly from his mailed shoulders. The torchlight glinted dully on the polished blue steel of his greaves and bassinet. A more baleful fire glittered bluely in his eyes. At first glance she saw he was no Kothayan. When he spoke she knew he was no Hyborian. He was clad like a captain of the mercenaries, and in that desperate command there were men of many lands, barbarians as well as civilized foreigners. There was a wolfishness about this warrior that marked the barbarian. The eyes of no civilized man, however wild or criminal, ever blazed with such a fire. Fine scented his breath, but he neither staggered nor stammered. Have I shot you into the street? He asked in barbarous Gothic, reaching for her. His fingers closed lightly about her rounded wrist, but she felt that he could splinter its bones without effort. I've but come from the last wine shop open. Ishtar's curse on these white-livered reformers who close the grog houses. Let men sleep rather than guzzle, they say, aye, so they can work and fight better for their masters. Soft-gutted eunuchs, I call them. When I served with the mercenaries of Corinthia we swilled and wenched all night and fought all day, I Blood ran down the channels of our swords. But what of you, my girl? Take off that cursed mask. She avoided his clutch with a lithe twist of her body, trying not to appear to repulse him. She realized her danger, alone with a drunken barbarian. If she revealed her identity, he might laugh at her, or take himself off. She was not sure he would not cut her throat. Barbaric men did strange inexplicable things. She fought a rising fear. Not here. She laughed. Come with me. Where? His wild blood was up, but he was wary as a wolf. Are you taking me to some den of robbers? No, no, I swear it. She was hard put to avoid the hand which was again fumbling at her veil. Devil bite you. Hussy, he growled disgustedly. You're as bad as a Hyrcanian woman, with your damnable veil. Here, let me look at your figure, anyway. Before she could prevent it, he wrenched the cloak from her, and she heard his breath hiss between his teeth. He stood holding the cloak, eyeing her as if the sight of her rich garments had somewhat sobered him. Who the devil are you? He muttered. You're no street waif, unless you're a leem and rob the king Seraglio for your clothes. Never mind. She dared to lay her white hand on his massive iron-clad arm. Come with me off the street. He hesitated, then shrugged his mighty shoulders. She saw that he half believed her to be some noble lady, who, weary of polite lovers, was taking this means of amusing herself. He allowed her to don the cloak again, and followed her. From the corner of her eye she watched him as they went down the street together. 
His mail could not conceal his hard lines of tigerish strength. Everything about him was tigerish, elemental, untamed. He was alien as the jungle to her in his difference from the debonair courtiers to whom she was accustomed. She feared him, told herself she loathed his raw brute strength and unashamed barbarism, yet something breathless and perilous inside her leaned toward him. The hidden primitive chord that lurks in every woman's soul was sounded and responded. She had felt his hardened hand on her arm, and something deep in her tingled to the memory of that contact. Many men had knelt before Yasmala. Here was one she felt had never knelt before anyone. Her sensations were those of one leading an unchained tiger, she was frightened, and fascinated by her fright. She halted at the palace door and thrust lightly against it. Furtively watching her companion, she saw no suspicion in his eyes. Palace, eh? He rumbled. So you're a maid in waiting? She found herself wondering, with a strange jealousy, if any of her maids had ever led this war eagle into her palace. The guards made no sign as she led him between them, but he eyed them as a fierce dog might eye a strange pack. She led him through a curtained doorway into an inner chamber, where he stood, naively scanning the tapestries, until he saw a crystal jar of wine on an ebony table. This he took up with a gratified sigh, tilting it toward his lips. Vatisa ran from an inner room, crying breathlessly, Oh my princess! Princess! The wine jar crashed to the floor. With a motion too quick for sight to follow, the mercenary snatched off Yasmala's veil, glaring. He recoiled with a curse, his sword leaping into his hand with a broad shimmer of blue steel. His eyes blazed like a trapped tiger's. The air was supercharged with tension that was like the pause before the bursting of a storm. Tisa sank to the floor, speechless with terror, but Yasmala faced the infuriated barbarian without flinching. She realized her very life hung in the balance. Maddened with suspicion and unreasoning panic, he was ready to deal death at the slightest provocation. But she experienced a certain breathless exhilaration in the crisis. Not be afraid, she said. I am Yasmela, but there is no reason to fear me. Why did you lead me here? He snarled, his blazing eyes darting all about the chamber. What manner of trap is this? There is no trickery, she answered. I brought you here because you can aid me. I called on the gods, on Mitra, and he bade me go into the streets and ask aid of the first man I met. This was something he could understand. The barbarians had their oracles. He lowered his sword, though he did not sheathe it. Well, if you're Yasmala, you need aid, he grunted. Your kingdom's in a devil of a mess. But how can I aid you? If you want a throat cut, of course. Sit down, she requested. Vatisa, bring him wine. He complied, taking care, she noticed, to sit with his back against a solid wall, where he could watch the whole chamber. He laid his naked sword across his male sheathed knees. She glanced at it in fascination. Its dull blue glimmer seemed to reflect tales of bloodshed and rapine. She doubted her ability to lift it, yet she knew that the mercenary could wield it with one hand as lightly as she could wield a riding whip. She noted the breadth and power of his hands, they were not the stubby undeveloped paws of a troglodyte. With a guilty start she found herself imagining those strong fingers locked in her dark hair. He seemed reassured when she deposited herself on a satin divan opposite him. He lifted off his bassinet and laid it on the table, and drew back his coif, letting the male folds fall upon his massive shoulders. She saw more fully now his unlikeness to the Hyborian races. In his dark, scarred face there was a suggestion of moodiness. And without being marked by depravity or definitely evil, there was more than a suggestion of the sinister about his features, set off by his smoldering blue eyes. A low broad forehead was topped by a square-cut tousled mane as black as a raven's wing. Who are you? She asked abruptly. Conan, a captain of the mercenary spearmen. He answered, emptying the wine cup at a gulp and holding it out for more. I was born in Samaria. The name meant little to her. She only knew vaguely that it was a wild grim hill country which lay far to the north, beyond the last outposts of the Hyborian nations, and was peopled by a fierce moody race. She had never before seen one of them. Resting her chin on her hands, she gazed at him with the deep dark eyes that had enslaved many a heart. Conan of Samaria, she said. You said I needed aid. Why? Well, he answered, any man can see that. Here is the king your brother in an Ophirian prison. Here is Koth plotting to enslave you. 
Here is this sorcerer screaming hellfire and destruction down in Shem. And what's worse, here are your soldiers deserting every day. She did not at once reply, it was a new experience for a man to speak so forthrightly to her, his words not couched in courtier phrases. Why are my soldiers deserting, Conan? She asked. Some are being hired away by Koth. He replied, pulling at the wine jar with relish. Many think Karaja is doomed as an independent state. Many are frightened by tales of this Dognato. Will the mercenary stand? She asked anxiously. As long as you pay us well, your politics are nothing to us. You can trust Amalarik, our general, but the rest of us are only common men who love loot. If you pay the ransom Ofer asks, men say you'll be unable to pay us. In that case we might go over to the king of Koth, though that cursed miser is no friend of mine. Or we might loot this city. In a civil war the plunder is always plentiful. Why would you not go over to Natek? She inquired. What could he pay us? He snorted. With fat plated brass idols he looted from the Shemite cities? As long as you're fighting Nato, you may trust us. Would your comrades follow you? She asked abruptly. What do you mean? I mean. She answered deliberately. That I am going to make you commander of the armies of Karaja. He stopped short, the goblet at his lips, which curved in a broad grin. His eyes blazed with a new light. Commander? And Krom. But what will your perfumed noble say? They will obey me. She clasped her hands to summon a slave. Have Count Thespides come to me at once, and the Chancellor Taurus, Lord Amalric, and the Argashupras. I place my trust in Mitra. She said, bending her gaze on Conan, who was now devouring the food placed before him by the trembling Vatisa. You have seen much war. I was born in the midst of a battle, he answered, tearing a chunk of meat from a huge joint with his strong teeth. The first sound my ears heard was the clang of swords and the yells of the slang. I have fought in blood feuds, tribal wars, and imperial campaigns. But can you lead men and arrange battle lines? Well, I can try. He returned imperturbably. It's no more than swordplay on a larger scale. You draw his guard, then stab, slash. And either his head is off, or yours. The slave entered again, announcing the arrival of the men sent for, and Yasmila went into the outer chamber, drawing the velvet curtains behind her. Surprise at her summons at such an hour. I have summoned you to tell you of my decision, said Yasmila. The kingdom is in peril. Right enough, my princess. It was Count Thespides who spoke, a tall man, whose black locks were curled and scented. With one white hand he smoothed his pointed mustache, and with the other he held a velvet chaperone with a scarlet feather fastened by a golden clasp. His pointed shoes were satin, his coat hardy of gold-broidered velvet. His manner was slightly affected, but the thews under his silks were steely. It were well to offer offer more gold for your royal brother's release. I strongly disagree, broke in Taurus the Chancellor, an elderly man in an ermine-fringed robe, whose features were lined with the cares of his long service. We have already offered what will beggar the kingdom to pay. To offer more would further excite Ophir's cupidity. My princess, I say as I have said before, Ophir will not move until we have met this invading horde. If we lose, he will give King Kassus to Koth. If we win, he will doubtless restore his majesty to us on payment of the ransom. And in the meantime, broke in Amalric, the soldiers desert daily, and the mercenaries are restless to know why we dally. He was an Median, a large man with a lion-like yellow mane. We must move swiftly, if at all. Tomorrow we march southward. She answered. And there is the man who shall lead you. Jerking aside the velvet curtains she dramatically indicated the Cimmerian. It was perhaps not an entirely happy moment for the disclosure. Conan was sprawled in his chair, his feet propped on the ebony table, busily engaged in gnawing a beef bone which he gripped firmly in both hands. He glanced casually at the astounded nobles, grinned faintly at Amalric, and went on munching with undisguised relish. Mitra protect us, exploded Amalric. That's Conan the Northron, the most turbulent of all my rogues. I'd have hanged him long ago, were he not the best swordsman that ever donned halberd. Your Highness is pleased to jest, cried Thespides, his aristocratic features darkening. This man is a savage, a fellow of no culture or breeding. It is an insult to ask gentlemen to serve under him. 
Aunt Thespides, said Yasmola. You have my glove under your baldric. Please give it to me, and then go. Oh, cried, starting. Go where? To cough water Hades, she answered. If you will not serve me as I wish, you shall not serve me at all. You rule me, princess, he answered, bowing low, deeply hurt. I would not forsake you. For your sake I will even put my sword at the disposal of this savage. And you, my lord Amalric? Amalric swore beneath his breath, then grinned. True soldier of fortune, no shift of fortune, however outrageous, surprised him much. All serve under him. A short life and a merry one, say I, and with Conan the throat slitter in command, life is likely to be both merry and short. Midra, if the dog ever commanded more than a company of cutthroats before, I'll eat him, harness and all. She turned to Shupras. He shrugged his shoulders resignedly. He was typical of the race evolved along Koth's southern borders, tall and gaunt, with features leaner and more hawk-like than his pure-blooded desert kin. Stargibs, princess. The fatalism of his ancestors spoke for him. Wait here. She commanded, and while Thespides fumed and gnawed his velvet cap, Taurus muttered wearily under his breath, and Amalric strode back and forth, tugging at his yellow beard and grinning like a hungry lion. Yasmola disappeared again through the curtains and clapped her hands for her slaves. Her command they brought harness to replace Conan's chainmail, gorget, solerets, cuirass, pauldrons, jams, quizzes, and salet. When Yasmola again drew the curtains, a Conan in burnished steel stood before his audience. Clad in the plate armor, visor lifted and dark face shadowed by the black plumes that nodded above his helmet, there was a grim impressiveness about him that even Thespides grudgingly noted. A jest died suddenly on Amalric's lips. By Mitra, said he slowly, I never expected to see you cased in coat armor, but you do not put it to shame. By my finger bones, Conan, I have seen kings who wore their harness less regally than you. Conan was silent. A vague shadow crossed his mind like a prophecy. In years to come he was to remember Amalric's words, when the dream became the reality.